Hi guys, welcome to the video on the solution process. Um, this is going to be the first video related to chapter 13. Um, and this video is going to be all based out of 13.1. So just some key vocabulary when it comes to solution. So a solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more pure substances. So in a solution, the solute is dispersed uniformly through the solvent. So the solvent is the component that's present in the largest amount. Um, this is what does the dissolving. Um, the universal solvent is water. So typically that's what we see as the solvent, but not always. Um, the solute is just the component that's present in the lesser amount. Um, so it's what gets dissolved. So remember that because it's a homogeneous mixture, um, the solute is dispersed uniformly throughout the solvent. Um, and when it comes to solutions, the ability of substances to form solutions depend on two things. The first thing is the natural tendency toward mixing, and the second thing is the um, energy that's required. So just a couple other vocabulary words. Um, miscible. So we have miscible and immiscible. So a miscible liquid is... Um, substances that mix in any proportion. So miscible and mix. Um, so an example, ethanol and water are miscible liquids. And they mix when you put them together. Um, immiscible are substances that do not mix or they do not mix significantly. Um, and an example of this is oil and water. Um, and then solids that are dissolved in a liquid are usually somewhere in between the two. And this depends on saturation that we're going to talk about in the next video. So when it comes to solutions, um, this is just a table that actually shows you different types of solutions that are formed based on the solute and the solvent. So if the solute is a gas and the solvent is a gas, so you're dissolving gas in a gas, you're going to end up with a gas as the state of matter for the solution. Um, we don't usually dissolve liquids and solids in gases, which is why there are the X's here. Um, but typically, just kind of a, a way to remember is, typically um, the state of matter of the solvent is going to be the state of matter of the solution, right? So notice if the solvent is a gas, the solution is a gas. If the solvent is a liquid, the solution is a liquid. Um, so that's just, just kind of ways to help you remember that. And so here are some examples of these different types of solutions. So. Um, if it's a gaseous solution, so you dissolve a gas in a gas, an example is air. Um, the example of putting um, a, dissolving a gas into a liquid, um, this is oxygen and water, but another one is carbonation. So in um, two liters of pop, right, you're dissolving carbon dioxide into that liquid. Um, so you can just see all of these different examples. Um, the solid, solid. Uh, solution. We talked about alloys in chapter 12. That's a perfect example of a solid solid solution. So factors that determine whether a solution will form. So I said there were two things. It was the natural tendency toward mixing and energy. <clears throat> so the natural tendency toward mixing um, is actually based on entropy. Um, and you can think of entropy as disorder. So the more disorder, the more entropy there is. Um, and usually solution formation increases the entropy because when you mix two things together, it's becoming more disordered. Um, so if it becomes more disordered, that's a greater entropy. Um, and that's because mixing causes randomness in the positions of the molecules. Um, and so because that increases entropy, um, the formation of solution um, will occur spontaneously. So if you increase disorder, um, the solution will most likely um, form spontaneously. That means on its own. Um, and then energy. So energy is based on the strength of the intermolecular forces. Um, neither the solute nor the solvent can be more attracted to itself than to the other. So this shows the intermolecular forces down here at the bottom. You have dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and ion-dipole. And this ion-dipole intermolecular force is going to really play a big part when we talk about solution formation. Um, when the energy of the system decreases, the solution will occur spontaneously. So I'll say that again. When the energy of the system decreases, if you lower the energy, okay, if it's exothermic, the solution process will occur spontaneously. 
So with the solution process, um, there are three types of interactions that we have to focus on when we look at the solution process. The first are the solute-solute interactions. Okay, so the solute-solute interactions must be overcome in order to essentially separate the solute. Um, the solvent solvent interactions must be overcome to separate the solvent and give place um, or give space for the solute. And then the solvent solute interactions um, occur as the particles mix. So there are these three types of interactions that we have to focus on. Uh, when the attractions between the solute and the solvent are strong, solutions are able to form. Um, and when we have the solution process, if we have an ionic compound, um, you know, very common example is NaCl, um, the solute molecules are surrounded by a solvent cage. And we're going to look at this in more detail. Um, but the extent to which um, a substance is able to dissolve in another depends on the size of the three interactions. So the solute, solute, solvent, solvent, and the solvent, solute interactions. Um, so the solutions will form when the solvent, solute interactions are greater than the solute and solvent interactions um, when they're attracted to themselves. Um, an example of looking at, at these intermolecular forces um, is oil and water. So oil is nonpolar, it's all carbon and hydrogen, um, which means the strongest intermolecular forces are the dispersion forces. Uh, where water is polar um, and water has the, the OH bond, which means water will hydrogen bond to other water molecules. Um, the hydrogen bonds in water are stronger, so they're more attracted to themselves than any attractive force between the two substances. Right? The strongest force between water and oil would simply be dispersion forces. Um, and so because water is more attracted to itself, it's not going to dissolve the oil when you pour the oil into it. So with the solution process, um, let's consider NaCl as the solute dissolving in water. Um, the ion dipole forces between the ions and the water molecules are stronger than the ionic force that holds um, NaCl together and it's stronger than the hydrogen bonds that hold the water molecules together. Um, and, and this is describing the process of hydration. So you can actually see in this picture um, that there's an attractive force between the negatively charged oxygen and the positively charged sodium. And so it's actually able to pull the sodium chloride apart. Now there's a video, um, you have a QR code in your notes to actually watch as this solvation process occurs and um, you should watch this so that you can actually draw out the solvation process in your notes. Okay, so how does a solution form? <coughs> um, the solvent pulls the solute particles apart and it surrounds them. And so this um, diagram down here actually shows the hydrated chloride and sodium ions. Now what this is called is this is called a solvent cage. Um, you can have a maximum of six water molecules around each ion. You cannot have more than six. Okay? You can only have up to six water molecules around um, a single ion. So when the solvent pulls the solute apart, so in this case the positively charged or the, the partially positive hydrogen is attracted to the Cl minus ion, the partially negative charge on the oxygen is attracted to the sodium and notice how it surrounds it like a cage. Um, this is called solvation. This is called the solvation process. Uh, when the solvent is water, it's called hydration. Okay? And again, um, there's another um, movie, a, a video online, um, you have a QR code for this as well, that actually, again, shows the solvation process. And this is extremely important when it comes to forming a solution. So just with rule of thumb, um, the process is called solvation or dissolution. Um, those two terms are usually used interchangeably. Um, but if it occurs with water as the solvent, it's called hydration. Those are some key terms that you need to know. Um, polar solvents dissolve polar solutes and nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solutes. This is the like dissolves like 
um, term that you're probably used to hearing. Um, ionic will also dissolve in polar solvents because of the ion dipole um, attractions, but that's not the same for polar because polar doesn't, ha or excuse me, nonpolar because nonpolar doesn't have um, the dipole. Um, however, like dissolves like is simply an observation. Okay? It is not a justification. Okay? I cannot stress that enough. It is not a justification. So if you're asked to justify uh, why a solution forms, you must, well this should say discuss, intermolecular forces um, and the solute-solvent interactions, not simply say like dissolves like. Okay, so um, that focused on kind of the intermolecular forces um, and the natural tendency to mix, but now we're going to focus on the energy side of it. So there are three processes that affect um, the energetics of a solution. So we have the separation of the solute, we have the separation of the solvent, and then we have these new interactions between the solute and the solvent. So we have three different delta H's that we have to look at. Um, and it depends on, so the, the heat of solution, so the heat of forming this new solution, depends on each one of these delta H values. Uh, remember that um, a solution will not form spontaneously unless it's an exothermic reaction, so unless the energy of the system is lowered. And so more on looking at the energy. Um, the first delta H that we look at is the delta H of the solute. Okay, this is the energy that's required to separate the solute particles. Um, if it's an ionic compound, this is the lattice energy, breaking up um, the solute. Now, because you are breaking ionic bonds or intermolecular forces, this is always going to be an endothermic process. Right? You're separating particles. Um, if For the <coughs> delta H of the solvent, Okay, this is the energy that's required to separate the solvent particles, so you're breaking intermolecular forces. This, again, is endothermic. So whenever you're separating either solute or solvent particles, it's going to be an endothermic process. Um, the delta H of the mixture, okay, this is bringing the um, separated solvent and solute particles together. Um, this depends on the intermolecular forces between the solute and the solvent. You're forming intermolecular forces. Um, this will always be exothermic. Okay? So as you bring the solute and solvent particles together, this is going to be an exothermic process. Um, if you look down here at the bottom, we have the delta H of solution. Okay, this is the heat of solution. This is the heat that's required uh, to form the solution. Um, this is simply adding up these three delta H values. Um, the solution process could be endothermic, okay, which is what a cold pack is, uh, utilizes is the endothermic reaction, or it could be exothermic, like a hot pack. Um, and these simply depend on the magnitudes of each of these delta H values. Okay, so looking at exothermic versus endothermic, um, for a reaction to occur, okay, for a solution to form, um, the delta H mix, when you bring the solute and solvent particles together, they must be close to the energy that's required to separate the solute and the solvent. Um, but remember that the entropy will also affect the process. Um, so if the heat of solution is actually small and positive, a solution will still form because of the increase in entropy. So let's just take a look at this picture up here. So this just shows everything at the molecular level. So step one, we have the solute. Um, it takes energy for us to expand it. Okay? It takes energy for us to expand the solvent. So both of these are endothermic, right? Positive, takes energy. Um, however, when we bring the two together, okay, this is endothermic. Um, and the overall heat of solution it depends on each of these three values. So if these two values are greater, okay, if the two endothermic values are greater, this is overall going to be endothermic. Okay? If delta H of the um, mixture is greater, okay, it's going to be exothermic. So this just looks at the energetics of the, of the solution formation. 
Um, <clears throat> but the size of the final enthalpy change will um, determine if the solution is formed. Sometimes we could have um, a smaller enthalpy of solution, so we might have a, a delta H of solution that is endothermic. But if we increase the disorder enough, it still could be spontaneous. Um, so let's look at <clears throat> these heats of solution. And so two questions that you have in here is, will uh, sodium chloride dissolve in water and will lithium chloride dissolve in water? So we know simply from lab and, you know, just from the real world, we know that salt dissolves in water. Um, but if we actually take a look at this heat of solution, right, this is the heat that's required to, to form the solution. Normally this needs to be exothermic for this to form spontaneously, right? So normally, um, if we want something to dissolve in water spontaneously, it needs to be an exothermic reaction. Um, but sodium chloride is endothermic. Um, so energetically speaking, if enthalpy was the only factor, salt wouldn't dissolve in water spontaneously. However, because the disorder increases, right, so we're breaking up Na and Cl, you're having, you have more disorder, you have more particles uh, moving around in, in the solution, um, the, the entropy actually overcomes this endothermic process and the solid still dissolves spontaneously. So notice there are two things that go along with forming a solution. Um, however, with lithium chloride, um, the heat of solution is already exothermic, so we can assume that this will occur spontaneously. Okay, so just because a substance disappears doesn't mean the substance dissolved. Okay, so there is a difference between an aqueous solution and a chemical reaction. So um, dissolution is a physical change. Okay, you can get back the original solute by evaporating the solvent. Um, but if you can't, that means the substance didn't dissolve, it reacted. So an example here is actually um, putting nickel into hydrochloric acid. Right? You actually formed nickel chloride and hydrogen gas. Um, so remember that there's a difference between forming a solution and um, having a chemical reaction. Now you guys hopefully should be able to tell if a chemical reaction occurs because you should see a color change, um, you should see a gas being formed, um, maybe a solid forms, um, but keep in mind a color change doesn't always mean a chemical reaction has occurred. Um, think if you put copper chloride into water, it turns blue. Okay? You formed a solution though, right? That wasn't a chemical reaction. So just keep in mind that, that there is a difference between uh, forming a solution and um, and having a chemical reaction.